my journey to academics started from a very unlikely background. So as far as I know, no one in my family obtained a four-year degree. My father is Hispanic. They worked working class, like hard labor jobs, and that's what they did to make a living. Um, my mom was very intelligent, worked as an IT um, associate or something like this. But many in my family just did not go to college, if not all of them for a four-year degree. Now, I'm pretty sure all of them. However, my grandfather, who I call Popeye, he was an electrician. And I always looked up to him as being smart in the family. And I loved him a lot. So I wanted to be smart, like Popeye from a very young age. So when I was in elementary school, it was somewhat disappointing that I struggled in my math courses or math course per year. <laughs> and in fifth grade, I had, I failed math. I failed the standardized exam that was given to me in fifth grade and I had to go to summer school. That was the beginning of a very long struggle for me in K-12 education. So I go to summer school, I'm able to make my way into middle school after elementary school, but I still am struggling at math and I'm struggling at other subjects as well. But math in particular was like really bad for me. Um, I remember, um, I had to go to summer school for math in sixth grade. And then in seventh grade, I had a teacher tell me that I wasn't going to amount, in, to, amount to anything. And this was in a, a math course or math class. Sorry. So used to college now. And I distinctly remember that is something that like I'm, 33 years old now, I still carry those words with me from that teacher in seventh grade so many years ago. I still carry those with me today. But regardless of what she said, I, I did summer school in seventh grade as well and made it to eighth grade. And, and as you can probably guess, in eighth grade, I had to go to summer school as well, made it to high school. I still just lacked all of the rudimentary knowledge needed to succeed in any type of math course or <laughs> actually many courses, but especially math. And I didn't have to go to summer school anymore. In high school, you can, at least in Texas, you can fail and then just like take the class again the next year you're, you technically move on, but you're still behind. So I failed math. I somehow made it past those classes in my, past those other classes and was able to go on, but math still was behind. I couldn't make it past algebra one. And that was very discouraging, especially since for some reason they put these people, these students, these kids, that struggled in math, they put us in the basement of the building where I went to high school. And it just was a shit show. None of us learned anything. The teachers weren't trying, or maybe they were trying, but the students were too rowdy to make things happen. So, I go through my years in high school. I keep on failing math. I keep on deciding not to go to summer school because I was so tired of it from fifth grade to eighth grade. 
and I end up dropping out of high school on my 17th birthday or a few days after that. Signed myself out and I was just done. I didn't care. The things that were important to me at the time were skateboarding, going out, <laughs> and nothing about the K-12 education system here in the U.S. ever showed me that I could do what I wanted to do, which originally, as I mentioned earlier, was to be like Popeye, my grandpa. He was an electrician, sciencey, smart, and I wanted to be smart. And I never once felt like I was smart in my K-12 education. So I drop out and I work for my dad's company. He happened to start his own business and hired me at, <laughs> as if I remember correctly, I think it was 5.50 an hour to work 7 a.m. to who knows what time in the evening, working on a truck, helping deliver medical gas in the back of a truck. It was honestly awful. And I don't know why I was satisfied with that at the time when it first started, but that's what I was doing. But then there became, not, there didn't become a, became a time or didn't, there didn't become a time. It was more like with time, I started to realize there's a stigma of being a high school dropout. For example, I was showing up to doctors, offices, dentist office, vets, surgery centers. I was showing up, delivering this stuff. And it almost seemed like some of them looked down on me. And maybe this was like a personal problem that I manifested myself, but I, I felt it. And even um, the girlfriend that I had, uh, she was eventually accepted to college and a, a very good college, a very good university. And I could tell that she was also sort of ashamed or having me around her friends because I was a dropout. And uh, that sucks. That sucks having that like pressure on you of you are stupid because you did this thing. So I felt personally stupid. And that sucked. Again, I can't emphasize that enough. That sucked. And it, it like really pushed something on me to like ugh, um, make me feel down about where I was at. So several years go by and I decide this is kind of monotonous. I, I'm, I'm thinking in the back of my head, like, I don't want to be dumb. I don't want to be stupid because I thought I was stupid. Not the case. Many high school dropouts are not stupid. Don't ever think that. Some of the smartest people I know didn't do well in academics, but they're still incredibly intelligent to me. Um, my friend, uh, Andrew, for example, didn't do well in academics, but I still think of him as like incredibly intelligent. So just because I thought it then doesn't mean that you should think it now. <laughs> um, but yeah, so um, it like working comes to a breaking point and I, with the help of my older sister, Gigi, that's what I call her, um, decide to go back to school. Now, by this time, I'm, I think I'm 19 or so, 20-ish, somewhere in that range. I, it's, it's been a while now. But I was too old to go to the school that I was zoned to. And I try to go back to HISD, Houston Independent School District, and I was too old to go to that school. So 
HISD has this other school called Drop Back In Academy. <laughs> I'll say it again, Drop Back In Academy. It's for students that are going back to school that they won't allow into the normal school that they're zoned into. And it was my only option. So that's where I had to go. And this school, for those of you who know Houston, this is in Fifth Ward a while ago now. And I had no idea what Fifth Ward was like. I live probably like a mile away now, like right here. But I had no idea what it was like, and I show up, and it's in, in, it's in a elementary school. This high school that they made for drop back in students <laughs> is housed in an elementary school within like three classrooms, basically. And if you showed up, you got a grade for a course. So I show up and I show up for college algebra. No, not college algebra, sorry. I show up for algebra one, I just show up every day and I get the credit. I show up for algebra two and I show up for geometry, I get the credit. So I quickly made up my credits, but I didn't really learn anything. But I will say, though, that I wanted to be smart, smart, whatever that means. I, I don't think that anyone knows really what it means to be intelligent, but I wanted to be intelligent. Or back then, I would say smart. Right. So uh, my math teacher, I forget his name, but he was so kind to me. And I asked him if I could like, did he think that I could learn math? Like, did he think I could go to school for math? And he told me that math isn't, or mathematics isn't something that you're born with. You, well, possibly some people, but I am hesitant to say that. But mathematics isn't something that you are born with. It's something that if you, just like any subject, it could be English, it could be Spanish, it could be whatever, physics, it doesn't matter. If you try hard enough, you can do it. And that's something that he told me. And it reminded me of skateboarding. So I'm a skateboarder, I always will be. And a part of skateboarding is falling, getting back up, trying again, falling, getting back up, trying again and then figuring out that you can do it through the process of failing. I failed my whole life in academics. I failed in skateboarding, we kept on and I got somewhat okay. But failing in academics, I didn't realize that that was how he did it. And this teacher told me that. So I, this sounds really bad, but like I stole a calculus book from that, that school. And I wanted to look at it. I was like, if I try hard enough, then maybe I can learn it. I didn't know what I was reading. I was like looking at Greek, <laughs> basically, but I wanted to do it. I, and at that moment, I realized like, okay, I can, I can be intellectual. I can be smart. I can do that stuff. So around that time, I started looking online about what degrees were, like what it meant to go to college. I, I, for the first time in my life, I thought like, oh, I could go to college. I was told I could, no one else told me I could because I always failed at everything, but this person did. So I looked up degrees and things like this, but again, I wanted to be like, intelligent. So I looked up the highest degree. And the highest degree that I saw that was offered anywhere was this thing called a PhD. Now again, no one in my family went to college. So I didn't know anything about how degrees work. 
I heard masters before, but I had no idea what a PhD was. But I was like, oh, that thing. I saw it online. I was like, okay. I know I want to be smart. So that's the thing that I need to do. I need to do that. And then I'll prove that I'm smart. All of that stuff from being a high school dropout won't matter. And I'll, I'll prove those people wrong if I get that thing. And then once I get that thing, then I'll officially be smart. So, all right, I have a plan now. Matt dropped back in. I want a PhD in physics or math or something that's what smart people do. And then the school shuts down. The funding ran out for drop back in. So then HIC was going to send me to a high school like 40 minutes away and it was like a really bad high school and I just, I was too old. I didn't want to do that. So I went and I'll just say the name of the school. I went to Bel Air where I was technically zoned and I begged the principal to let me in. She agreed. She saw that like I was sincere about wanting to like finish my high school diploma and make it through. And during this time, I also decide that I'm going to be smart again. I keep on doing that. It's annoying, but I'm just like, it sounds so silly to me to say like I wanted to be smart. I had no idea what it meant to be intelligent back then because I was, I just didn't know what it meant to be intelligent because everyone had told me that I wasn't. <laughs> so I start listening to NPR because that's, I figured that's what smart people did. And I started buying layman's physics books and layman's math books, like telling the story of math and physics and what it meant to do those things. And I, I just was reading them constantly as I am allowed into Bel Air, Bel Air High School. So I'm there and I, because I had those credits from drop back in for algebra one, geometry and algebra two, I was able to like select a, a elective, I guess. I don't know how it works in high school. I literally don't remember that much about high school because it was such a blur, but I was able to enroll in pre-calculus. And I did that because I wanted to learn math. I wanted to do the thing that like, I was so terrible at for the first 19, 20 years of my life. So I enroll with the best teacher the most like influential teacher that I've ever had. I'll, I won't say her name because I don't know who's gonna watch this, but she, she helped me. So I enroll in pre-cal with this teacher and she, I talked to her, I told her my story. In fact, all my teachers knew that I was coming back and I was trying to like finish my diploma, my high school diploma. And all of my teachers also saw me reading layman's physics books, layman's math books. In fact, I'll say this though, my first layman's physics book that changed my life was um, Brian Greene's The Elegant Universe. That book like made me like, oh, I have to learn all this exotic fancy math and physics and stuff. So, they see me reading these books and I'm trying and I'm trying and I'm struggling in pre-cal. I did not have the background, but I was trying. I even went to my, one of my best friends at the time, Matt, I went to his parents who were both doctors. One was a dentist, one was a pediatrician. I thought their whole family smart. I went to them like trying to seek help and I'm trying and my pre-cal teachers helping me during lunch. And through some miracle, I, I ended up making a C in pre-cal the fall, fall semester and was able to continue on to take pre-cal in the spring. I was psyched. I was like, yes, I'm like getting there. I'm like somehow going to get to that PhD. It's not that far away. 
in my ignorance, obviously. So I, I like, I um, come back for the spring semester, but like personal things happen. I went through a breakup with my high school girlfriend. I thought it was because I was dumb. I, well, because I was not going to college, not dumb, because, well, back then they were the same. And also I was in a high school. I was 20 years old, 19, 20 years old, surrounded by little kids. And that can be depressing. And one day, um, my sitting in my Spanish one class, which I had to take, never passed that earlier, I was just trying to learn. And then this kid mouthed off to my teacher and she was the sweetest teacher. She was so sweet. And I couldn't understand why he did that. It bothered me so much. I had to like stand up and I, like I walked out the door and I just stood there. And then my teacher came and talked to me and I was like, I'm gonna leave. And I was old enough where I could just sign myself out. So I signed myself out. So <clears throat> I sign out, I'm depressed. I'm not enjoying the atmosphere. I still wanna like get the PhD. I wanna, even though I have no idea what the PhD is, but luckily my teachers at Bel Air, they saw me trying and they also saw the stress I was going through. So one thing led to another shortly after that incident in my Spanish one class and they talked to me and they told me it would be okay to drop out again which is strange, but bear with me, it ended up working out. Not all of my teachers, but several of them told me they were confident that if I got my GED and went to community college, I would finish my associates, which at the time, because I was lacking so many credits in high school, I would have finished my associates probably quicker than I would have finished my high school diploma. That was their reasoning. And I'm glad they told me that because I didn't know. I didn't know that was a possibility. So I drop out again. Oh, so I drop out again. I drop out in the spring semester. I forget what semester, but I drop out of Bel Air. And I had no idea how to get my GED, but I drive to uh, Houston Community College in downtown Houston, like the big main building they have. I'm looking for a GED. <laughs> and it was the administration building. They don't have any testing or any courses there. It's just this big building, which I thought was the place to go. And they direct me towards HUC, Houston Community College Central. I wander around and I find a way to take my GED. I take my GED and every subject, with the exception of math, I place into college level courses, but math, I did pretty bad on. In fact, I tested into intermediate algebra one and there's two of them. <sighs> Disappointing because again, like I'm still in the back of my mind, like I want that PhD. I, like I wanna be this smart intellectual person, which by the way, I'm still like, binge listening to NPR at this moment, but it's not seeming to help. <laughs> um, so I take my GED, I pass with the exception of math. So HUC is going to place me into um, remedial math one. 
Now, as some of you might know, as well, as some of you might be first year college students, or first, not a first year, first generation college students, navigating the school system can be difficult. I understand you. I was one of them. I literally wandered around. I didn't know how I was going to pay for anything. I just knew that I wanted that PhD thing far away seeming, but in my naive place, didn't think it was that far. And I'm wandering around HTC. I go to the registrar's office and I honestly don't know how this happened. I don't know how they did this anonymously, but I go to ask how I'm gonna pay for classes and one or more of the teachers from Bel Air High School had put something like a thousand or $1,200 into my account. That money, I'm sorry. That money paid for so much. It helped me enroll in my courses. It helped me pay for textbooks. <sighs> and most importantly, it made me think that these people I thought were smart believed that I could go to school. So with that money and the help from my, my grandmother, who her name is Dolores, love her as well, just like Popeye. With that money, I enrolled at Houston Community College. <laughs> and I had my, my first two courses that summer because I was like gung ho about going to college. So I left Bel Air in the spring semester and I enrolled at HCC in the summer, first summer session. I enrolled in um, Intermediate Algebra 1 and a course for students that are dropouts. I forget the name of it now, but it was a course where it was specifically suited to make sure that students going to college knew that it wasn't just a walk in the park. And I'll, I'll never forget, I know the exact room, by the way, I know the room. Um, at HTC, I drive by it sometimes and I, I think back to what it was like walking into that room for the first time. But I, it was a course for students like me that had struggled, that decided to go to college. And one of the first things they told us was, and I forget the exact percentage, so I apologize if I'm off, but I think it was something like the professor telling me 68% of the students 
in this classroom won't finish their associate's degree. Now, luckily for me, I had the backing of these people that just paid so much money for me to attend college. And I was, I was stubborn and I've always been stubborn. And that's one of my personal faults is that I'm stubborn. And I was like, no, I'm not going to be one of those 68% or whatever the, the percentage was. But it still like scared me because it was just a reminder of how many times I failed in the past and how likely it might be that I would fail again if I tried to pursue a degree. And I wanted a PhD. I was, as I've mentioned, I was just like, that's what I wanted. I was so ignorant of it, of what that meant. But that's what I put my mind on. And in order to do that, I had to at least get past an associate's. So it was scary. But luckily, community college is small. Luckily, I had this backing behind me to like get me in there and move forward. So I take that course for people that struggled in school. I took intermediate algebra one which I made a B in, by the way. I make an A in the other one. It was like a one credit hour course, so it didn't matter that much. But to me, like an A and a B, that meant a lot because I had made Ds and Cs the prior 20 years. So second summer session starts and then I enroll in a new Intermediate Algebra 2 and uh, a psychology course. And I own it. I, I, I make an A in both courses and I'm so proud and I just feel like these people that have been backing me since I decided to go to college, like it, it means something. Like maybe they were right, maybe 19, 20 years of doubt, I can learn from my mistakes and like go forward. And I do, I do really well. I take 15 hours, I take in the fall. So after that second summer session, I take 15 hours. I take history, English one, which by the way, I was so nervous about English one. Uh, because I struggled in English in high school in on the first day of class in that English class. Um, the professor is asking students like what they expect to learn and what they're worried about. And I didn't realize that this was the case because I was so naive. I was like, I'm really worried about punctuation and I, I, I'm looking forward to learning about punctuation and when to use semicolons versus colons. And I don't know, and the class laughed at me. Like they audibly laughed and then the professor made a joke about it as they were laughing. That sucked because I was being honest about where I was at going into that class. Of course, like, it's not English one, it's like composition one or whatever. That course is about like writing and telling stories. I didn't know that. I had no idea what to expect going into that class. And I'm going on a tangent for this like composition course, but those little things affect how you feel where you're going. And that sucks. I ended up making A in that course, but 
I still felt belittled and dumb because I said an honest thing and classmates laughed at me and my student, my professor happened to make a joke about it, not realizing how much it affected like me as a person. But overall, that fall semester, I own it. I take college algebra. I take a lot of core classes, make all A's, I think. I think I made all A's. I take a mini semester over the winter break for trig, because I thought math was super important for me to get caught up because I wanted to like go really far. And I go into the spring semester, take pre-cal, the second very like composition two, history two, like these types of classes. I take all those, I take 15 hours, do really well. And because I'm doing well, I get some confidence in me and I'm like, okay, I know I can do this. I don't need the associates, that's taking more time. I'm gonna to transfer to a university and get my bachelor's degree because I looked up online and that's how you get closer to a PhD. You need your bachelor's to be admitted to a PhD program. So I decide and I apply to U of H main campus, University of Houston main campus that spring. And I get accepted as a physics major. I was reading a lot of phys physics books and that I thought that's what I wanted to do. So I get accepted. And then in the spring, I take one more class at HUC, uh, Cal 1. Make it through Cal 1, but didn't have the best instruction for the course, but I make it through. So then I show up to U of H main campus. So I go to U of H main campus and I'm super excited. I'm enrolled as a physics major. The campus is really nice. It's much nicer seeming than HCC. And I'm just like, yes, I'm making it to this PhD. I, Cause I, in the back of my mind, I'm still thinking PhD. But it's not so easy. I excelled when I was at community college, but being at a big, almost tier one university was completely different. For example, I, my Cal 2 class, my first fall semester at U of H main campus had something like 250 students in the lecture hall and these things called recitations where they have a grad student on Fridays teach you how to solve the problems. It was rough. It was really rough. I, I struggled with a lot of the intricate bureaucracy parts of going to a larger university because I was so unfamiliar with it. And I, could, I didn't know to go to anyone to ask for help. I didn't know that I should be talking to other students about, are they struggling with stuff? I was personally ashamed. I, I felt ashamed that I didn't know how to get financial aid. The classes were so much more expensive. The classes were so much more like bigger. <laughs> I, I didn't know how to navigate that system. I was excited, but I was also hiding the fact that I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know how to be a student at that level. I rushed into it too fast. I thought I could, but I just, I rushed in too fast. And I forget my actual grades. I probably need to look this up, but 
I know I failed at least one class that semester. Uh, I know I made a C, no, I failed Cal 2. I did fail Cal 2. I made a C minus in linear algebra. I remember that one because that counts. C minuses count apparently. And I failed physics one. I think I only took three courses. In any case, it was a shit show. I didn't know how to pay for things. I was trying my hardest to figure that out, figure out how to find my schedule, figure out how to schedule exams for my courses because the exams were held not in the lecture hall, but slightly off campus. I just wasn't prepared for that that intensity of academia. As hard as I wanted to try, which by now hopefully you know that I wanted to try, I just I wasn't prepared for it. But I'm stubborn. I completely mess up my fall semester going into UH main campus. And spring semester comes around. I'm on academic probation. I enroll in some courses and the same thing happens. In fact, I missed my astronomy final. I missed it completely. My fault, but still, I just didn't know what was going on. My ignorance, my like lack of knowledge, really my lack of knowledge in how to be a college student completely ruined my time at U of H main campus when it should have been a great time. So I get kicked out. After two semesters of U of H main campus, I'm kicked out. And this again was just not again, but this was a big failure for me. Considering like how many times I failed in the past, this one happening when I thought everything was going well was horrible. I didn't know what to do because in the back of my mind, I'm still thinking I want a PhD in either math or physics. And I can't even like cut it at a four-year university I can't make it, like, what am I doing? I started questioning every choice I was making. I started questioning whether or not I belonged because at the very beginning of my life, first 20 years or so, I didn't belong in academia. I didn't belong to what I thought was like the smart crowd, the intellectual crowd. I didn't belong and I, I felt like I was an imposter, which some of you might know about this notion about imposter syndrome. That's how I felt as an undergrad. I didn't feel like I fit in because I was failing so bad. So that summer after U of H main campus, I have to take a break. I. I just, I needed to like reset some things. I couldn't go back to U of H main campus. My friends that I met at U of H, University of Houston main campus, they were taking summer courses, they were moving on and I was a failure again. I mean, I felt that weight from all the things before I dropped out, I felt that weight on me. So I make it through the summer, but still I, like, I have to finish that PhD. And then I see that another university, U, uh, University of Houston downtown had open enrollment like super late in the, the fall. And I see that they don't have a physics major, which that's originally what I wanted to do, but they had an applied math major. 
and I was I was thinking to myself because I didn't know the difference. I, I was like, that's close enough. So I'll enroll there. Applied math, physics, basically the same thing. Okay, I'll do that. So I'm able to get into UH downtown. And it's so much better for me personally. And so I take Cal 2. The class isn't 250 students, it's 15. I go to financial aid. Instead of a line of 70 people, the line is like 20, 10. And when I talk to the financial aid people, they're able to really talk to me. And I'm not saying anything bad against U, uh, University of Houston main campus. I'm just saying that because everything was smaller and because no one in my family went to college and I had no idea how these things worked, I was able to get into the system and navigate the system at U of H downtown much easier than I did at U of H main campus. It's the only difference I'm saying. But that difference was a huge difference for me. And I enroll in my courses and I am not doing well, but I'm not doing terrible either. I think at the age I was, which was probably like 20, two, three-ish, 22, something like that. I just was a dumb 22-year-old. I didn't know how to manage my time between being very poor <laughs> and going to college, getting financial aid. I didn't, managing my time, I just, I didn't know. It was my ignorance again that caused me to not do the best I could. And though this is happening with me and this story with academics, I think this goes to every aspect of life. A lot of the bad decisions or off setting things that happen in life don't come from not wanting to do good that come from just ignorance of how serious the situation is. And many things in my life have been that way. And maybe I'm <laughs> off in that way, but that's just how I've been. So I do moderately okay. But then personal things happen. So I'm at, I'm still at U of H downtown, but personal things happen. For example, you might get arrested or you might have a best friend that dies. these things can affect how your academic performance happens or how it plays out. Luckily though, I'll say this before I move on to that luckily losing my best friend completely shattered how I could possibly function in academics at that moment. And one of the reasons why I share this story with my students is that we have no control over what happens in our lives as students. So if things happen, they happen. And I hope that you move on from those things that happen. But things happen to me. But I was so lucky to be at U of H downtown that when I came back, from these things. 
I finally made enough mistakes. I finally fucked up enough that I knew what I needed to do and I did it well. I took 17 hours, 19 hours each semester after that. And not only did I do that, but I brought aspects of my life that weren't related to math into what I learned to be my math, mathematics, as a math major. I realized that being curious and asking questions, even if they're wrong questions, but if you ask enough questions, sometimes you get lucky and they're important. And I did that. Somewhere around my senior year, I asked a question that had never been posed before. And I asked my now boss, but then professor, um, Dr. Pepper, this one question. And it turned out to be a new question that no one had asked before. And we ended up writing a paper on that write a paper that was submitted and published at a very high end mathematics journal, which most undergrads in math do not do. And we did that. And as I'm graduating, and I'm making all A's, by the way, I forgot to mention that, but I'm making straight A's in all of my classes as an applied math major. And I have a paper that was written based off of a question that I asked. I finally started to realize that maybe, maybe I do fit in, sort of, maybe. Maybe I do fit in with what it means to do intellectual things. And as you know, I wanted a PhD from the beginning. Since I <laughs> looked up online what a PhD was. So I applied to grad school, like right as I was graduating, had this publication coming out, I applied to grad school. And my dream was to go to Rice University, which in Houston, Texas, US is like, the, it's a big deal to go there. I didn't get in, but I did get into Texas State University in San Marcos, Texas. And I went there for a year after getting my bachelor's degree in applied mathematics from UVH downtown, which by the way, I'll show a picture here in a moment, but uh, Popeye and grandma Dolores, uh, they went to my graduation and Popeye's kind of a softy like I am. And uh, he, he cried in the picture that I have of him that I'll show you uh, is he's like tearing up as I'm graduating from UH downtown. But after that, I, like before that I was accepted but after that graduation, I went to Texas State University. Um, I was in a math education PhD program which that math ed program is awesome. And if you're interested in math ed, you should check it out. Or math education, you should check it out. Um, you get to take upper level graduate mathematics courses and you also get to take courses in math education. I had no idea what math education was and I found out when I was there, but it's very interesting. It's basically researching how people learn mathematics and how people interpret as they're learning mathematics. And I loved it. And I love Texas State. I can't emphasize that enough. Some of, I, some of my best times were had by talking with professors at that university as a grad student in that PhD program. The only downside was that in the back of my mind, I still wanted a PhD in math or physics. And a PhD in math ed 
wasn't what I set my goal on. It wasn't what I wanted. So I'm owning it in this program. I love everything about Texas State. I'm making A's in all my classes. It's perfect. But I'm still missing out on what I started from and was a PhD in math or physics. So I, after a year there, I applied to grad school in a either applied or pure math department, which by the way, when I was at Texas State, I happened to be a part of another paper in pure mathematics. So I'm getting much better at asking questions in math and posing new problems. And I am doing that and it's leading to new mathematics and I'm just falling in love with mathematics, even though I also love math education, which they are different. And I knew that I wanted to do that as my PhD, not math ed. I sometimes regret that, but I knew I wanted that. So before moving forward, I wanna say that at the end of a mathematical argument, you give a mathematical argument, you often write, hopefully well, you can see this. So you give like argument for why, so you have like a statement. And then you write a proof. And you give some like sequence of logical arguments. And at the very end of that, you put this little box. This seems like a tangent, but roll with me here. Statement, proof, box. Well, what does that mean? Well, that means Q, E, D. which is an abbreviation of a Latin phrase saying, which roughly translates to, well, the phrase itself is quod era demonstratum, which roughly translates to what was to be shown. And as soon as I started applying to math or applied math PhD programs, I told myself, and I told myself, probably before, but I knew for a fact that if I ever got into a math or applied math PhD program and I finish that PhD, I'm getting quote era demonstratum tattooed on me somewhere. As soon as I do it, because what was to be demonstrated would be exactly what I started with as a dropout and telling myself I'm going to make it to that PhD. So I apply to these programs and I'll never forget the day I was finishing, I had like a, like a grad student teaching assignment at Texas State and I was walking back to my car and I get a call from Rice University you were admitted to the program, the PhD program. I cried, like I literally cried. Because I used to deliver medical gas in the medical center in Houston, Texas, across the street from Rice. And I used to look up to that university saying like, that's amazing. It's a beautiful campus, by the way. If you don't know what Rice University is, look up pictures of it. It's a beautiful campus. And I used to look at it as a dirty truck driver working early mornings to late at night, just looking at it and wanting to be there. And I got a call saying that I was accepted. I'll never forget that. And I leave Texas State University and I go to Rice. It was hard. I was excited, but I was also so nervous and unsure of if I fit because every student that was there was so, to me, like they seemed so out of my league intelligent. 
but I was there and I was trying. And to be honest, as far as the coursework went, I barely made it. I barely made it. And I didn't even finish my PhD there. I did finish my master's before any of the other students, which by the way, the incoming class is like five students, so it's tiny. But I did finish my master's because I was good at asking questions and I kept on asking questions and working on things and just beating my head against trying to be smart. So I finished my master's. I get a publication out of that master's, one publication. And I was so like caught up with how I felt at the time. I couldn't focus on anything other than trying to be, I need to do research, I need to do research. So I, so I just completely forgot how to pass PhD qualifying exams. So I fail my PhD qualifying exams. But to be fair, only two passed that year out of the five that were there. But six, six students that year. Um, but I did write a master's thesis. I did have a paper, so they wanted me to stay there. And I tried again and I just, I couldn't focus on what I needed to focus on. So I needed to either like stay or, which I basically couldn't, or leave and not finish the PhD that I wanted from the beginning, like the very beginning. Luckily, I am a very social person and via email, I emailed this professor in South Africa that had very similar research interests to me. We worked on the same things. I looked up to him. So I just sent him an email with a problem. As I mentioned earlier, I like asking questions. I like posing problems. So I sent him an email and we worked on the problem. We ended up writing a paper on that problem and it was fun. I got to work with this person and we communicated every other day, even though he lived in South Africa, we communicated every other day. So I asked him if he would take me as a PhD student. He agreed. Now, South Africa is a, they're under the European style of PhDs where in order to be admitted to a PhD, you have to have a master's in the PhD, PhD degree is only research. So I had a master's from Rice and I had research problems. So he admitted me, I had to get my passport and enroll, but I enrolled at the University of Johannesburg. I didn't have to be there. I just had to work with him on research via email correspondence. And he was the best at it. His name is Michael Henning and I owe so much research to this man and so much guidance to him. He taught me via just email correspondence what it means to be a mathematician. So <clears throat> during this time, I happened to get a job at Texas State University where I went to grad school for a year as a lecturer. And I'm lecturing there, teaching four or five courses per semester, while also working on my PhD with Michael Henning in South Africa via email correspondence. And I was also somewhat like poor at the time. So I was working a third <laughs> position at this place called Mathnasium in the evenings. So I'd wake up, respond to emails from my PhD advisor, go teach classes during the day, get off, 
drive immediately to Mathnasium to teach K through 12 students math. And that was my routine over and over and over again. But the math research that I was doing, I was so excited about and I was just loving it. Still like just trying to make it happen. And then I see that University of Houston downtown has a lecture position, lecturer position open. And they're kind of focused on this field called data science. I happened to be slowly getting into it at the time. So I contact my old advisor at U of H downtown. I get hired at U of H downtown and I'm still working on my PhD. As I'm teaching four or five classes per semester while also working part-time as a bartender as well. These were long days. And if anyone <laughs> that was in like close to me at this time was in any possible way hurt by me, shaming, not shaming them, but like putting them off, I was a wreck with my time, my energy, I was only solely focused on this task of lecturing and trying to finish my PhD. And I honestly, I hurt people in the process by ignoring social interactions because I was so obsessed. As I've mentioned, I wanted to finish that PhD. So I do regret that. I do regret the toll that my PhD took on the people that like, it might not seem like it in hindsight to them, but to me, people that meant something to me, like being so focused on this PhD, I hurt a lot of people by just only focusing on that. So I'm working at U of H downtown as a lecturer, writing at my PhD writing up all these research papers. And finally comes a day where like I put all these research papers into a thesis. And because I was so obsessed with research and like finishing the PhD, I think when I finally wrote up all my dissertation, my PhD dissertation, I think I had like 12 papers total that were like related published papers or to be published papers that were related, that were involved with my, my dissertation. I submit it in the way that University of Johannesburg works is that um, you submit your dissertation and then it goes under review for three, four or five months. Three months is I think typical. And I'll never forget after it was literally like 10 years to the month from me dropping out of high school again after deciding to get my PhD to this one day I finished teaching a pre-cal course and I always check my email after finishing teaching to see if I needed to do anything at UVH downtown. I checked my email and I was told that my dissertation was approved. And my advisor said, Michael Henning said at the very end of the email after he told me that it was approved with like very, very minor revisions, he said, congratulations, Dr. Davila. My last name. <laughs> and I remember breaking down. All the students left the class and I was just sitting there in front of the computer and I broke down. And 
It took so much to do that and so many failures. I don't know in hindsight how I did it. And along the way, as you might have noticed, I, I thought throughout the process that I didn't deserve to be an academic or to be in intellectual or to get a four-year degree, to get a master's, to get a PhD. I didn't think that I deserved that so many times because when I looked up at the professors, I didn't realize that maybe they might struggle too, which by the way, I'm a tenure track professor now. I am one of those people. <laughs> And the reason why I tell this story to my students is because I know that some of them are going to have a hard time because life, figuring out school, paying for things, eating, paying bills, like all these things can make the journey hard. And I want them to know that just because they look at me as a professor, doesn't mean that like I didn't go through the same thing. And I guess I'll end it on two things. First off, when I submitted my dissertation and I knew it was going to go through, Quod era demonstratum, QED, what was to be shown. It was the first thing I did after knowing that it was going to happen, that I finally got the doctorate, my PhD. And then second, I have this. That's what all of my work did. And for fun, I got a little Johannesburg tattoo right there. It's the University of Johannesburg logo. Thank you for listening.